guys, we, we were going to start right on time. We, had, we just got an email. A couple people were having trouble with the links. So we're going to give this another one or two minutes. And then uh, I'll start in about 90 seconds. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. This is Rohit from Kestro Financial. Hey, there, Rohit. Hi there. Hey, how are you? Good. All right. In the nature of time, I'm going to go ahead and start things. And, and Jess, if you just keep on uh, admitting people and keep them on mute, that would be great. And that way uh, we can be respectful of people's time here. Um, so guys, I, I just want to welcome you to our 30 minute Agile workshop. And thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Nate Camp. I'm one of the managing partners here at Curate. I'm going to start with a quick 30 second overview of the company, mention a few housekeeping items, and then I'll introduce Richard. Uh, so do me a favor. There's a chat button at the bottom of your screen. If you could open that and send a direct message to me, Nate Camp. If you have any burning concerns or questions that you want to get addressed during the call today, I'll do my best to ask uh, Richard to answer those for us. Uh, Curate Partners is a boutique professional services and staffing firm founded in 2014. We specialize in digital product, data and analytics, and agile. We have a perfect five-star Glassdoor rating. We've been recognized by Inc. Magazine, the Boston Business Journal, and staffing industry analysts just rated us best places to work for the last four years, as well as fastest growing technology staffing firm in the US in 2020. Finding, attracting and retaining purple squirrels, which is the hard to find top tier talent is one of our core values. Richard Lovell is one of our purple squirrels. Um, he leads our agile practice where we help our organizations in their agile journey, uh, whether through the agile jumpstart program, and that's for organizations just beginning their journey uh, assessments and roadmaps for organizations that are a little bit farther along, or even coaching, training, and even staffing support. Uh, Richard's been with us since our inception seven years ago. He has led agile engagements at CVS, Blue Cross Blue Shield, and Fidelity, and many others. He joins us today to talk about some of the reasons you may not be seeing the ROI uh, from your agile transformation and some of the challenges. Um, we're going to keep the meeting brief. I promise I will get you out of here by 4.30. Uh, we'll address as many questions as possible and we'll provide contact information afterwards to continue the conversation. Uh, please remain muted until the end. Again, any questions, send me a direct message or a DM as the kids call it. And um, thanks again. Uh, at this point, I'll kick it over to Richard. So good afternoon. Um, I've been doing Agile for, I think, 21 years now. Um, I went to a conference in Chicago where um, one of the founders of Agile, Ken Schwab, was talking. And um, sort of that's when the chip was put in my neck and you know, I've been an addict. <laughs> so with that, one of my um, favorite things about Agile is it's about teamwork. And uh, I was reading something the other day and Michael Jordan there was a quote from Michael Jordan about teamwork, and you'll see it here at the bottom. And it's actually now one of my favorite quotes. So that's why I put it in here. Um, so let me give a quick run through on the agenda. Um, we're going to have a quick overview. We're going to look at why scrum masters uh, don't always get to be successful, why we have too many people on a team. Um, why there are managers in organizations who still want status reports, which is always my favorite thing to do. Um, and then customers who have no input, no input to our epics and our stories and our features and all the other good stuff that we do. And then just another um, you know, really important piece is like test automation. And is it something you dream about or is it something you uh, are not really trying to do? And then we'll go to some questions. So, Let's look at an overview. Um, there are a bazillion things that can go wrong with an agile transformation. You know, companies are, are complex things. People are complex. Um, and it, it makes it difficult if you don't do it right. 
what I see a lot of uh, in, my, in my travels and my conversations around the Agile community, I see a lot of what I call zombie scrum. It's, it's become a, a, a common sort of term now. If you Google it, you'll see there's people have written, written lots about it. And what it really is, 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 is kind of fake Agile, where you've got people who are still doing requirements, then they throw them over the wall at an Agile team and the Agile team gets all these, you know, stories and epics that look like war and peace. They're like 30 pages in a story. Um, they have, you know, incredibly de detailed um, acceptance requirement, acceptance criteria. And um, it's almost impossible for, you know, the team to function normally. There's no working software. Um, there's no autonomy. Um, and really the customer has no, no input. So I picked a few of the things here to talk about, which you know, I see as common failure points for, for Agile. And um, you know, if we look at Agile, there are really you know, five important things that you've, you've got to get right. You've got to be right with the people. You've got to focus on the culture. Um, even, you know, in the safe, latest safe version, um, 5.0 or whatever it is now, 5.1, um, culture has become something they, they talk about quite a bit, which they didn't do before. And personally, I think it was a mistake because I think culture and people are the most difficult part of getting Agile to be right. It's easy to set up a Scrum team. It's very difficult to make it work properly. Speed is, um, you know, very important. Um, you know, if, if you're not doing automation, then you're not eliminating wait time. Um, you know, who, I'm sure all of us um, have spent time waiting for QA. Well, there's a problem there. You shouldn't be waiting for QA. Um, Prioritizing, you know, that, that is not right when you're not considering what the customer really wants um, and you're not building um, the right thing, you know. And a lot of the decisions that people make in, in the product owners and the product group, you have to decide what you're not going to build, right? So it becomes what's the minimum viable product? And that minimum viable product is just enough to keep your customer happy. You know, too many times I see development groups and product groups working in a non-agile environment. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to build a Rolex, but really that customer is a Timex customer. They want, they want a $20 watch. They don't want a $2,000 watch. And that's a really important concept. If you build too much, you're wasting. And um, Microsoft actually used to be a classic example of that. The example of Excel, you know, most people use about 8% of the features in, in uh, Excel. And if you think about that, that means that 92% of what was built by Microsoft over many, many years is complete waste. You wouldn't do it with your own money but um, people do it all the time. They waste company money all the time. Um, fail fast, an interesting concept. In Agile, it works really well because you've got two week sprints. And if you fail in a sprint, you've wasted a few thousand dollars. In, a, in Waterfall, you know, you waste millions because you, uh, when you fail, you fail at the end of it. And that's been a year's worth of work. In Agile, it's just a couple of weeks. So let's look at some empirical data um, to prove that uh, Agile works well. So this is a study that's been done every year for I think about the last 10 years by the Standish Group. Um, it puts the Agile teams um, with 8%, an 8% failure rate and waterfall teams with 21%. So anything else in between that, if you're, if you're not doing real Agile, then you're gonna be somewhere you know, in that 21% of failed 
projects, as opposed to 42% successful, 50% challenged, and only 8% failed. But it's a good, good way to think of it. It's, it's data, um, it's proof, um, it's not um, anecdote, it's real stuff. So you have to show this to your boss, it's a good one to show your boss. Um, because he won't be able to argue with it. Well, he will argue with it, but you know, he's not right. Okay, <clears throat> let's get into the first pass. I see this happen a lot in, in organizations which haven't made the real transition and they're practicing fake agile. You have scrum masters who report to the PMO because the PMO still exists. And that's, you know, a problem in itself. Um, you get the PMO managing scrum masters like their project managers. They expect status reports, expect, you know, tons of paperwork and bureaucracy when um, actually the JIRA board or the rally board is enough to tell them everything that's going on. They just don't understand it. Um, I've been in organizations, I've been in transitioning organizations where the PMO is still requiring people to have you know, status, uh, requiring scrum masters to have status meetings. Status meetings are a complete waste of time. Um, you have your daily stand-up, you have the board, you can see the velocity, you can see the work in progress, um, and you can see what's going on, if you understand it. Um, one of my favorite things to hate with the PMO um, is the planning without understanding writing code or having some vice president who used to write code, maybe he write, wrote COBOL or something like that, and he's now planning um, for all the people on the work they're gonna do, but has no idea what it really takes. I've seen it so many times and all those projects fail because they don't really understand what's going on. So you have to, if you're gonna to work together, you've got to plan together. So the scrum masters, the PMO, the stakeholders, that's, you know, that's the time to do big room planning or PI planning, whatever you wanna do and plan out the next six, seven sprints, something like that. It's so common, it's painful to watch. Um, so you get time and tasks, assigned by people who've never written a line of code in their lives. It's extraordinary to watch. Um, resource planners create teams without input of the team. Of course, resources is the wrong word to start with. People are not resources, people are people. People are people who do the work. Um, and if you're um, not considering those people, then you know you're destined for failure because that's what happens. Um, if you want to fix it, you've got to set up a transformation center of excellence. Um, you've got to plan the retirement of the PMO. Um, the PMO usually um, is costing you something between 25 and 30 percent of the cost of a release. Um, again, that's data from the Standish Group. Um, The hard part now becomes if you're going to retire the PMO, um, you have to retrain and repurpose the people in the PMO for agile roles. Some of them will make it. Um, when I was at Fidelity, a lot of them um, managed to convert because they were given the right coaching, they were given the right training, and it worked really well. Other organizations um, have not done it so well, and it's, it becomes quite painful for the organization to go through layoffs, but um, you know, if it's done well and there's consideration for the people, uh, not the resources, the people, then you know, those transitions can be quite good and quite successful. Um, let's go on to another one of one of my favorites um, that you know, I've been doing some agile assessments. And what I've been seeing is you know, the stand-ups run for 45 minutes. Why does stand-ups run for 45 minutes? So the scrum master is not doing his job um, and is not empowered, is the other thing. So there's two, two factors there. The scrum master is not being allowed um, to 
uh, do his job. And he lets, he's unable to stop those loud voices hijacking the meeting. Um, the team is using the stand up to communicate um, instead of one on one. So the communication between the team is bad. So they wait for the, you know, they wait for the daily scrum to say, hey, Joe, what about um, X? Instead of texting someone, WhatsApping them, um, using Teams, using um, whatever other, you know, chat program you've got, or just picking up the phone, for God's sake. Um, they're not doing that. And that's a problem. And it's got worse with COVID because we're all working from home and we're talking to each other even less. That's when co-location was so good, when you could actually have teams sitting in the same room together and you, you, you turn around and you say, hey, Joe, how do I do this? And you get an answer in two seconds. But people get lazy, they email each other. <clears throat> um, problem solving an issue during stand up, tangential discussions, managers who've, who've come to the meeting and they interrupt the flow because they actually shouldn't be speaking until the end of the meeting and they should ask for permission. Different way of looking at it because managers are enablers. They're, not, they're no longer um, command and control people. They're the people here to help you solve problems. Um, they're not here to sort of interrupt and uh, you know, create, um, create interruptions. That's a good word. Um, and then another one is, is the team doesn't get to um, update the board. They don't look at the board. They, it's not the first thing they open in the morning. And then when they get to the stand-up meeting, they are um, having to update the board. And that's not, not the right way to do it. You should be updating the, the board as you go along and you do your work. So the cures for this is, you know, you get back to basics. You start uh, with the three questions which um, if you've done any Agile, you'll know what they are. And one of the things that I've had, you know, work very successfully is to set up a solution meeting. It's a 15 minute solution meeting right after the stand up. You make them two separate meetings. Um, and it's a time to fix the things that came up in the standard meeting, stand up meeting. Um, and it's about fixing it quickly so that work can progress. And then you keep track of the promises and commitments. Very simple solution. It takes 15 minutes. Only the people who've got a problem or can help fix the problem have to show up. If there are no problems, guess what? You, uh, you uh, cancel it. And then everybody can you know, go back to work. Another solution is to ban email. And uh, what I've done in a couple of situations, if I hear the, if I hear the, um, <clears throat> I email them. Yeah, I sent them an email, I'm still waiting. Uh, an example, year ago, I was looking at somebody's email, they were sharing their screen on, um, on WebEx and they popped their email up to look for something and they had 2,700, 2,730 something, don't remember the exact number now, um, unread emails. So what do you think is gonna to happen to your email? Not very effective. It's a lousy way to communicate, talk to each other. Um, the 15 to 20 people on a team. Um, Bezos has talked long and often about the two pizza meeting, and it's true. Um, the causes in most organizations are single skill developers. Um, so you don't have what you call full stack or sometimes called comb shaped developers who've got lots of skills and can do more than one thing. Um, another thing that you know, creates it is the old culture, the number of people equals productivity, which is not right. Um, the release can have too many features. So your product team's not doing the right job and they're giving you too much um, stuff or you need to start up another team. The other thing is, you know, over, I've seen this a ton of times as well, an overstaffed development org that has to have every person assigned. So they make resource, this makes, you know, having, lots of people on teams and everybody assigned to something makes the resource planners look good. Another one is the release is just too big, the scope. Um, you're trying to build it all, you know, 
more people equals more features. No, it doesn't. That's not how it works. You need to, you know, prioritize the features. Goes back to the Rolex and the Timex conversation I, you know, started earlier. Um, the cures for this is uh, split the teams into smaller ones. Hire the developers at a full stack. Limit the scope. And educate the people planners um, that you know more people doesn't equal productivity. And um, if you're working with outsourced um, people, if you're working with a Cognizant or a Tata or someone like that, um, just tell them they've got to supply better people because often you know you get one person who can do one thing, and that's not the right way to be a developer today. You need to be multi-skilled. Richard, I had a question that came in. Um, you know, talking about the team sizes, the question was how many scrum teams uh, is appropriate for each scrum master? Two. Two across the board, that's, and, and that's- Two, preferably one. 70 people per team? Yeah, so if you, I've seen, I've, I've managed two teams. I've managed three, but it's really difficult. Um, but the best, I think the best, um, the most pragmatic answer is two, but the best is one. There should be one Scrum Master per team. That's, that's the answer I have there. Um, and actually there's a, a follow-up. Um, is it appropriate for one of the developers to be deputized as the Scrum Master? No. Scrum Masters should be Scrum Masters. Developers should be developers. If you want that developer to be productive, then that developer is a developer. If he's a scrum master and a developer, you're not going to get um, what you want out of them. Um, status meetings, one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, management is focused on the project. Um, a lot of managers still focus on the project because that's the old way of thinking about it. I've got funding of X to do Y, and it's going to go from January the 1st to July the 2nd, as an example. They don't look at it as a product. So the product view is much more um, holistic. And if you think about, let's say, car development, um, and how Toyota or Honda um, develop cars, if they looked at it just as by the project, you'd still be driving a 1979 Honda Civic because that's the way IT looks at things. They do a project, they fix one thing, and then they don't look at it again for about five years. Um, the car guys um, or um, consumer, consumer products like Procter & Gamble or Unilever or someone like that, are constantly looking at the product, how to improve it. Um, so IT organizations need to um, change their view from project to product. Um, and when they do that, the ones that I've seen that do that become very successful because they're constantly looking at how they can improve the customer experience or the product they're creating, whether it's an internal product or an external product. Um, Another thing is that managers aren't trained to, to understand their agile metrics. Agile metrics are, are different from um, project management metrics. You know, when did you last hear of a waterfall project looking at its net promoter score? They didn't. Um, they don't look at continuous improvement. They don't look at the value that's being delivered to customers. And then of course, there are always the guys who hate agile and they exist. The cure, Training, get the people to understand Agile. Okay, um, customers have no input to the epics and the stories. Um, it's classic. Um, the product group thinks they know what the customer wants. They have no data to prove it. Um, part of um, so many organizations, they'll release a product and then it doesn't get used. Um, it doesn't do what the customers want. Um, the feedback from the customers is very negative. Um, 
and product management is really just not doing its job. Um, a lot of agile people now really understand product management and they understand what it takes to, to, to be um, a good product manager and what it takes to feed the agile teams with good product information so that you can have great stories and great epics that produce great value for the customers. Um, again, it gets to um, some difficult decisions sometimes where you've got to hire new product owners um, and you've got to hire new product people because you know, the old way of, of throwing stuff over the wall really doesn't work. Um, if you're brave, you just stop accepting epics and stories with no data from the customer or some, you know, prototyping or something like that. It's difficult, but can have um, huge benefits to the teams when you say, no, um, I'm not taking that because you don't have any proof that it's good for the customer. Challenging, but um, difficult. <clears throat> Challenging and difficult one. Test automation. Um, you have siloed de development organization. Um, they're always waiting for the test to be completed. Bugs found late in the release cycle and sprints don't get completed. That just happens so often um, that, um, and I sometimes just don't understand when I listen to senior management about why they don't want to invest in automation tools, when the product ends up being late, so the customer doesn't have a, so let's say it's a, you know, um, the, an online sales um, tool um, and shopping carts and stuff like that. And they don't wanna, you know, invest in the, in, in the tool, so it's late then they don't get as many purchases, therefore they don't have as many sales, therefore they don't have as much profit. Kind of weird. Um, <clears throat> some of the cures start doing TDD, uh, test-driven development or any of its flavors. There are various flavors of TDD. There's behavioral driven development and a couple of others. Um, developers should be doing their testing. Um, you don't need QA. Um, you have uh, developers actually test what they write. Um, merge the testing and development tools. A lot of testers make become really good developers when they're trained properly. So um, that's a, a good thing to do. And invest. It'll save you money in the end. It doesn't save you. It doesn't save you money at the beginning, obviously, because you've got to invest the money to get the money back. But um, when you do it right, um, it works really well. So that's, that's my quick presentation. Um, so if you have any questions, um, you can um, email Nate. His email's up here. We're gonna send you the recording. We'll send you a PDF, so that email will be in the PDF. And really, if you have any questions, uh, I'm happy to answer them. You can either email me or we can set up some time, um, 15 minutes, half an hour, and we can go over the particular problem you have. And um, thanks for listening. Awesome, Richard, thank you. And there was a handful of questions that came to the chat window, which we won't have time to get to, but I will pass each of those off to Richard and he will respond to those. And uh, anything else that you wanna to touch on, just like Richard said, send me an email and we will uh, get those answered for you. I will, answer, I will answer those tomorrow morning and you will get an answer tomorrow. There we go. We have, a, we have a time box now. Perfect. Richard, thank you. And thanks everybody for joining us. And we'll do this again soon. Thanks. Sure. Thank you. Thank you.